dive into teleports features. We use RFDs as design documents to um, better understand the problems we're trying to work on, the what, the why, and the implementation details. For today's talk, I have Sack with me. Uh, Sack is one of the engineers that works a lot on teleport desktop access, along with Andrew, who's previously left us. Um, but he's still here in spirit in some of the code. This is our second RFD discussion. You can actually see RFD1 um, that covered hardware tokens. Um, and I'll put a link in below. And for people who are new to Teleport, Teleport is the easiest, most secure way to access all of your infrastructure. You can see us at goteleport.com. And we are an open core company, meaning the majority of Teleport is available on our GitHub and it's open source. Everything that we are showing here is available in our community edition, so it's free for you to use. And you can review and read all of the code. And this is also another reason why RFDs are important to us. If you're trying to understand the problem that the code is trying to um, do, you can look at the RFD and it better explains sort of the problems and how we got to it. So Zach, um, thanks for joining. Can you give a quick introduction? Yeah, uh, hey everyone, I'm Zach. Uh, I've been with Teleport, geez, uh, almost six months now. Uh, and before that, I was actually using Teleport as a customer. Uh, so love the product enough to come build it. And uh, I guess I was lucky enough to inherit uh, the desktop access feature. And uh, here we are. So yeah. Uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. Great, so we're gonna have, um, I think it's four different RFDs. Um, I might as well kick it off with the first one, which is this RFD 33 is just a high level introduction into desktop access. And I think desktop access was unique because it was the first time we allowed users to log into remote desktop GUI environments, as opposed to the origins of Teleport, which started off as SSH. And then we extended it into getting cube configs and then databases, then applications. But I don't know if you can say, Zach, what some of the unique challenges that are different for sort of GUI environments? Uh, yeah, I think number one is just the amount of data flying back and forth is a lot more, right? When you're streaming a, a virtual desktop, uh, everything from the live session to things like session recording just require a larger amount of data, more bandwidth than, you know, text-based protocols. So. Uh, I mean, the first time we've dived into that, uh, we've got to play around a little bit and understand how that might stress some of the limits of the system. Yeah, and I think our first RFD, we sort of go over <clears throat> some of the existing services that we have um, and sort of how we designed it to sort of extend and work with it. Can you give an overview of like the high level architecture? Yeah, so the idea here is obviously the, the number one motivation for us building desktop access is access to Windows hosts. Uh, Windows just generally tends to be the environment where um, the tools you need to access are only available via a user interface. Um, however, we don't wanna go out and build something that would only work on Windows. We wanted to leave the possibility open to support uh, graphical access to other types of environments as well. So the idea here is that um, the desktop itself gets presented in the browser teleport is sending the screen kind of back and forth in real time. And that protocol between teleport and the user's web browser is not specific to Windows or any other desktop protocol, something that we can reuse. Uh, so that's what you see here, kind and that's of the it. web UI and proxy, right? Yeah. And so people interact with the web UI over WebSocket, and then the desktop protocols over mutual TLS. Right. Yep. And so the idea is that proxy is essentially a uh, translator between theoretically any number of desktop protocols and then our own custom, what we call TDP or teleport desktop protocol, which is kind of meant to be a very simple, naive uh, protocol. Um, so the, the subsequent RFDs that we'll look into, will go into more detail on what that means specifically for Windows. Um, but the idea here is we have some backend service that's OS specific. Uh, maybe it's for Windows RDP, or maybe in the future, it's like VNC for Linux or something like that. Um, and that backend service will make the actual connection to the remote desktop that you want to access, uh, and then translate between that protocol and TDP in the user's browser. 
yeah and then i think we could sort of go over to here um sort of extending the target os or the rdp or x11 as the os protocol yep um and then we have the do you want to talk about the protocol at all um there's nothing super fancy in the protocol obviously since rdp was kind of our main driver in our first implementation um you'll notice uh, a lot of the messages are pretty similar to what's in rdp uh, although a lot simpler um, the goal right now is to try and keep our options open and so the the more we make our protocol look like rdp the harder that becomes um, it's also just meant to be kind of small lightweight easy to parse um, things like that yeah and then we have the client um an authorization here i think this might be better if we just do a demo um because i think at this point of the rfd it was quite early stages of how we would solve it um you know and this is when, did, when was this written in october um of last year was it last updated so it's probably in the summer of last year that um we started yep. this um, but we can, yeah, let's do a demo and then we'll go into authorization afterwards, um, which is kind of sure. a core-ish concept. So, um, I have a teleport eight cluster here and, um, the only way you access teleport desktop access is using the teleport sort of web UI GUI, um, which is also referred to as the proxy sort of interchangeably. Um, and then I'm going to log in with GitHub. And for people who aren't familiar, you know, this would be the experience. So for people who are using Teleport for server access, we provide the same UI that you can access nodes. Um, and then you can also use the same workflow with your local terminal, and it will retrieve SSH certificates. But in the case of Windows, desktops, the experience is sort of familiar that you have a list of all of your hosts. Um, we have the name and labels, which we'll go into in a bit. And you have the ability to sort of assume and log in. In my case, I'm logging in as the administrator user. And then from here, I have a full um, GUI experience. What's a fun thing? Calculator um, that you can sort of use a relatively high-ish frame rate. Um, maybe you're not going to be in CSGO championships, but definitely enough to perform the most amount of tasks. And if you have anything to add, or well, we can come back and forth between this and the RFDs as well. Um, yeah, not much. I think we're definitely not the first, um, but we, we did consciously want to only offer this uh, UI via a browser. Uh, we think the sandboxing provided by modern browsers offers a kind of extra layer of security and also just in terms of distribution, it's much easier to not require any extra software on the machine. Just fire up your web browser and connect to your desktops and you're kind of good to go. Um, all right, back to FD. So authorization is next. Um, and this is sort of a core part of Teleport's role-based access control. I think I kind of showed one example of, actually, if I, I can show you my role um, or the modification of my role, which I think this has changed. Though we have Windows desktop labels and Windows desktop logins, and then this maps to my access role, and this means I can login both with administrator and the internal logins, which means in teleport land, because I've logged in through GitHub, my internal login is Ben Arendt. So I have that login available to me. And then with labels, this is another way of filtering. This is obviously you can um, do star star for all. Um, and we'll probably go into this the next RFD for Windows specifics Active Directory. And I know we have a few other options here, such as the ability to turn on the clipboard or the um, session recording, which hasn't been implemented yet, but this is sort of a similar standard teleport RBAC flow. Are there anything else to add there? Uh, nope, this is all meant to be familiar to teleport uh, existing users, familiar with our RBAC system. 
Uh, really, the only difference is how those labels get applied. Um, but essentially, what we're doing here is just saying this user can or cannot connect to these hosts depending on what labels are present. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's also deny to, um, which is another important, you know, if you want to, they overrides the allow um, so people can't log into like prod servers. And then I actually saw a community user ask us today, how does the mapping work? And it's definitely, if you have a small, you have the option of having, you know, multiple people logging in as administrator, and then you have the full audit log as well as um, I started a session as Ben Aaron as administrator to this server. And so you can link back, you know, people are sharing these one credentials. So show right. if SAC was doing these administrator things instead of just seeing your Windows logs or oh, administrator logged in and having to figure out what right. happened. Uh, all right, let's, we, I think we're session recording, but let's jump into that um, in a bit. Um, let's go to number 34. So 34, this is the bulk of Windows specific details. Um, do you want to start with anywhere specific in this tag? Uh, no, top to bottom works for me. All right, let's go. So let's start with the architecture. Um, Great. Yeah, so here's the kind of the first thing you see different is now we start to see Windows specific things below the proxy layer in this diagram. So remember everything proxy and up is not OS or protocol specific, um, but below that now we start to specialize on Windows. So we have a Windows desktop service that only knows how to talk RDP and we'll connect you to a Windows desktop uh, and then translate those RDP messages into teleport desktop messages. And then what's the difference between the LDAP connection and the RDP connection? Right. So the Windows desktop service uses LDAP uh, for a couple things. Um, the first is to automatically discover eligible desktops. So if you have a very large environment with lots of Windows hosts, um, you probably don't want to manually, you know, build up a list of all the ones you want to make available to teleport. Um, at the same time, you probably have too many that, you don't want teleport just to find all of them, or maybe you do, um, but you need some way for teleport to be smart enough um, to make these hosts available to you. So we use LDAP, uh, which is a protocol that Active Directory implements uh, where we can uh, basically make queries and um, get results back. And so we will construct a query for computers on the Active Directory domain. Uh, we allow the user to further customize that query if you want to filter down your results or select a subset of your Windows hosts. And then Teleport will automatically register those in the cluster and make them available to connect. In fact, if you go back to uh, the demo real quick and you look at your list of desktops. Let me finish the session. Should be able to see. Yeah, yeah so if you just pick one of these. Um, that teleport.dev slash origin label, uh, which is like the third one usually, uh, dynamic basically means that it was discovered automatically via LDAP. Um, we also support just manually defining desktops in a configuration file. So if you have tons of desktops, but really only two or three of them are important that you want in teleport, you can just disable the auto discovery and kind of hard code those desktops in your configuration. So in my case, I have basically everything, which includes my domain controllers, which would probably be something you'd want to filter out and not necessarily yep. expose it. Yep. And so that's another thing is if you're not using this automatic discovery via LDAP, you don't get a lot of these nice labels that show uh, what version of the operating system are running, um, the DNS host name, that kind of stuff. Uh, we're able to pull that back because that comes back in the LDAP result that we make. Yeah, and this is my IP address. And I think because I'm using um, EC2 instances, this is the, the unique right. host name that EC2 is kind of a bit funky with Windows hosts, but, but yep. how they how they show it. Cool. So that's the first use of LDAP is just discovering host to connect to, which is an optional behavior that you may or may not enable. Uh, the second use of LDAP, which is an optional is, uh, and we can talk more about this in the authentication section, but in order for us to connect to the Windows host without requiring a password, uh, there needs to be some things in place, some certificates in the right spots. 
And we're able to automate some of that by using LDAP just to make the kind of setup of the whole process a little easier. So on startup, Teleport will connect to LDAP server and put some certificates and things in the right place so that when you go to uh, authenticate, it works for you. Cool. Now, as far as the actual connection to the desktop, LDAP's not in, in that flow at all. So once the desktop is available and registered and connected, um, and you actually go to initiate that session, there's no LDAP happening at that point. It's just a standard RDP connection from the desktop service to the desktop. And then that's using the identifier of the host name, which you can either pre-populate or can be found through LDAP. Right. Yeah, so we have the order discovery. Um, and then supported versions, I think we go back to Windows 7 and um, Windows Server 2012 R2, which I guess is now a decade old. Yeah, um, I think that just comes down to picking the versions that are still commonly in use, but also support the Windows authentication mechanisms that we require. Yeah. And we have the protocol. I know this is sort of this was crafted and accumulated over time. Um, we must have jumped to security concerns. Yeah, so RDP is huge. Uh, it's protocol upon protocol. Um, has a lot of features uh, and has worked for a very long time. Uh, but also just given the size, there's been a history of vulnerabilities in the protocol. Um, so we wanted to make sure that one, we didn't expose RDP all the way to the end user. And two, any kind of RDP connections that we make are made in a memory safe language, something like Go or Rust. Yeah, and I, this was the first edition of Rust for Teleport. Can you talk about the decision? Uh, yes. Um, technically, there was kind of two editions of Rust at the same time, but we'll say this was the first. Um, I know the yeah, Crustaceans so the, will probably argue. I know Forrest probably had some Rust somewhere. Right. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, so at the time, we were kind of looking, uh, settled on RDP as the protocol of choice to connect to Windows just because it's always there. And there's no additional kind of per desktop software to install if you use RDP. Uh, and we started surveying um, what RDP implementations are out there today because um, rewriting that all from scratch would be quite an effort. And we didn't see a lot of great Go options. Uh, there's, of course, free RDP, which is very popular uh, and a great project written in C. Um, but C for us is too, uh, too risky, uh, just in terms of the type of vulnerabilities that arise there. Uh, but we did happen to find a Rust implementation of RDP. So what we're doing is using... Uh, basically uh, CGO, which is the foreign function interface for Go code to call into C and compiling the Rust library in a way that it just looks like C. Uh, so there's kind of this big mix of um, interop happening there to convert between the various layers, but um, it works and we get the kind of safety that we desire. And then that would be at uh, like this point here behind the scenes. Right. So part of that Windows desktop service is actually running embedded Rust library inside it. Uh, most of it's written in Go. Um, there's just a, a small Rust section in there. Um, and the Windows desktop service kind of encompasses all that together and does the translation back and forth. Cool. And how was your sort of your experience adding this into our teleport pipeline? Uh, it was fun. Uh, well, just because of the, you know, anytime you're the first person to do something, uh, you miss a bunch of things. So it took a while to iron out all the issues, uh, and make sure it works on all the different platforms and architectures that we support. Right. Uh, it was pretty easy to just get running on your developer workstation. Uh, but then you realize that we actually support, uh, 32 bit Linux, 64 bit Linux. We support ARM, we support old CentOS builds. Uh, and trying to make sure everything worked on all those different combinations took a little while to get right. In fact, okay. we're still working on a few things there. But um, And then do you have any advice for any other Go projects thinking of including Rust in this manner? Uh, other advice? 
I don't really have any other advice at this point. No, uh, I haven't. Uh, I haven't fully decided how much I like the approach myself. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how things turn out. Time would tell. Um, right. I, I'm also still learning Rust, uh, and I really want to like Rust, um, and I think I will, but not smart enough yet. I kind of kind of get over that initial learning curve. I think still. Yeah, and actually, I think because uh, this design document has still to be updated, but here's some of our. Um you know, the three degrees of things is either use the RDP RS Rust library, use lib RDP via Sego, uh, or use, implement our own RDP protocol in Scratch, <laughs> you know, as the most extreme right. version. Yep. And then we went for, did we go with the RDP RS Rust library? We did, yep. Yeah. And then it supports smart cards, which is sort of a core part that I guess we're covering in, um, authentication and then this um modes i know our current release of teleport 8 only supports the gateway mode um which is similar to our kubernetes access it lets you provide a a range of hosts from one teleport service um but i think agent mode is really interesting um you want to talk about what agent mode Proposes. Yeah, this is super interesting. So with the gateway mode that we've implemented today, you have a relatively small number of Windows desktop services compared to the number of Windows desktops you may be able to connect to. Right? So one desktop service might be able to proxy connections for tens or hundreds of desktops behind it, um, which that's super easy to deploy, runs on Linux, just like the rest of Teleport. Um, and is a little bit more, I guess, resource efficient too, just because you're running less software. Uh, but agent mode kind of flips that around and says, let's actually run the Windows desktop service itself on each and every Windows desktop we want to connect to. Um, so that's interesting for a few reasons. First of which is it'll be the first time Teleport itself runs on Windows. Um, today we can run the TSH client on Windows uh, and some things like that, but the, the core and a bulk of Teleport doesn't yet run on Windows. Um, so that'll be required to make this work. Uh, but when it does work, uh, the nice thing about this approach is you don't have to expose RDP outside the local host uh, network adapter. Um, so given that RDP is often a uh, target uh, for malicious actors and has had some vulnerabilities in the past, uh, it'd be really nice to be able to ensure that the only RDP traffic that's flowing uh, is just on the box itself. And then the kind of service that's translating RDP into TDP is not happening a network hop away. It's happening right on the Windows host. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely <clears throat> I experienced this while setting up um, Teleport Desktop Access by leaving RDP exposed to the internet, which is an awful idea. And yeah, it doesn't take long uh, for known vulnerabilities to get popped. And I guess this greatly reduces that. Yeah potential. The other interesting thing here is when we do agent mode, we won't have that LDAP based desktop discovery because each desktop service will only be reporting the desktop that it's running on. So there's no need to like discover additional hosts. You just go ahead and run that system service on any desktop you want to be available. And I think we have here that you can also possibly collect, um, also allows you to block all inbound connections, which is also interesting mm -hmm. because there's like a, reverse tunnel. Um, and then what would the other session information that we could collect um, on this example? Yeah, so this would be like using some more advanced uh, kernel features uh, analogous to what EB eBPF has done for Linux uh, to detect what system calls are made, uh, what network access was performed, um, what directories uh, were accessed, uh, all sorts of things like that, just to kind of get more structured metadata about what happened in the session, uh, which will be nice for auditing. So instead of having to, you know, sit through and watch a recording of exactly everything that somebody did and kind of get a high level view of what was done and why. Yeah, that's um, super interesting. So what was the reason for not including agent mode? Are we still waiting for more feedback or was it just sort of time? Uh, no, it's just a timing thing. Uh, thus far, it's just been two of us and uh, there's a lot there. So uh, looking to grow the team. Uh, in fact, planning to double uh, in the next couple of weeks. 
Um, and cool. Ninja Mode is is something we're uh, we're excited to get to work on for sure. Um, and then I since this is very you know targeted to other developers or people interested in the code. Do you have any tips for people who are thinking of applying or considering Teleport as a place to work? I know you're also a new person to working at Teleport. Uh, yeah, uh, if you're interested, you should apply. Uh, it's super exciting stuff we're doing and I could definitely use the help. Uh, so uh, if, this, uh, if this sounds fun and you want to learn more, uh, let us know. Yeah, I think we're on, I mean, you'd even open a GitHub issue or send us a pull request or just go to our careers page. Yeah, yeah, all those would be fun. Uh, and then, okay, let's go on to authentication. Um, and I think this is the early days in which we were sort of deciding how to work with Windows. Um, right. And I think Sasha, our CTO, has a great blog post on being completely passwordless and not supporting username and passwords, which is potentially quite controversial in the world of the traditional competitors um you know they're sort of very fancy password managers on top of like an rdp client um can you talk through some of our thoughts around um authentication and short-lived credentials and how we sort of gone about this problem yeah so as you mentioned we're trying to move away from passwords right passwords kind of static uh easily leaked and then um you know easily exploited Whereas a certificate has additional metadata attached, often has an expiration date, very short lived. Uh, the attack window is much smaller. Uh, and of course, it's just harder to remember, or you know, you can't quickly catch a glimpse of it and then you know, take it with you. Um, so, in terms of certificate based authentication on Windows, when it comes to RDP, uh, there's really only one choice, and that's with smart cards. Uh, so early on, we were kind of thinking. We'll aim for smart cards and then offer the traditional kind of enter your username and password as a fallback. And we made the decision not to allow that fallback, meaning the only way to connect via teleport is using the kind of smart card certificate based approach. Okay. Yeah. And I know we'll be going to that uh, in the next RFD 35. Um... Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. The major implication of this here is that um, you can only perform certificate or smart card authentication on a host that's joined to Active Directory domain. So if you have kind of a standalone Windows box running somewhere that's not part of a domain, that kind of rules that out as something you could connect to from Teleport. Um, we'll be looking into uh, Windows Hello in the future, which is uh, kind of the next gen Windows authentication supports biometrics and things like that. Uh, but behind the hood, that's also just a uh, smart card emulation. Um, so we're hopeful that in the future, that's what we'll use to connect to standalone uh, Windows desktops. But for now, Active Directory is required. So, uh, you know, for my home Windows machine, I would it wouldn't be capable right. of adding it to Teleport. So you have to have you have to be a very keen hobbyist to have a right. Active Directory home server. Um, they do exist, though. We've met keen hobbyists with Active Directory domains. Um, which I'm sure they're very grateful to have a free, secure way of accessing right. their home cluster. Um, let's keep going. And so the Kerberos tickets is also something we do not support. Correct. Uh, that's more common with machine to machine authentication anyway. Um, yeah. But it just wasn't a good fit for teleport. Um, okay, then we have host discovery, which kind of talked through a little bit. Um, we have the way to discover it. So it can be hard coded, I think in the hosts here. Um, yeah. Or we can use the discovery. So if you provide the credentials for LDAP, there's username, password, and the certificate. This is sort of our boilerplate, but you can also, you know, save this to a file locally. In fact, you must. This is must. Uh, this design doc is old. Uh, yeah, but you can't put the password directly in the configuration file like this. Oh, it's a password file. I think it's the updated one. Right. Yeah. We actually might as well go through this since we're here. So 
Teleport has this big YAML if you run it in um, the config file, which is probably the only way since there's so many configuration options. Um, this mode also only runs in gateway. I'm actually go to the docs and then we have discovery and discovery filtering and then the host labels. Um, and then uh, let's keep going concurrent session. Uh, before, yeah, before we go there, just concurrent sessions, do you want to talk about this? Um, no, nothing too special here. We're essentially just relying on RDP's native support for this, um, which I actually believe is related to your Windows license um, in terms of the number of concurrent connections you can have. And am I correct in thinking from my own testing, you can have multiple ones yourself, but not add other people? I think... I think it's the other way around. Multiple people can have a session on the same desktop. Uh, but if you try to create a second session as Ben, your first Ben session will be terminated. Terminated. Cool. Um, then we have the config. I can might as well just go quickly to our docs and then just show the updated config file. So if anyone who's interested in you know getting started, I have a um a similar 24 minute getting started video. I'm gonna say this is probably my longest getting started video. Um, I won't, you know, we're going, we'll go watch the full 24 minutes of it, but the majority of this is actually configuring Active Directory services and configuring your domain controllers. Also with a sort of fresh Active Directory domain. If you're likely already have a large fee fleet it is probably easier to add it and also run it alongside whatever existing solution you currently have in place. Um, would I be correct in saying that, Sike? Yep. Um, you know, we have things that you need. So um, configured for LDAP S, um, which is the encrypted version of LDAP, um, which I believe we did find some people running the standard LDAP during our current discovery calls with customers. I yeah, talk about uh, I'm sure it's out there. Um, again, just in line with our security principles, um, we really don't want to be making plain text connections in 2022. Yeah. And then along with, we create a restricted service account, and then this is used for the LDAP user. And this is also one of the reasons the setup takes a little bit longer. We put extra effort into making all of the accounts and users um, as least, least privileged as possible. And so for the example, if uh, people are coming in here, adding the LDAP um, user and password. If you follow our instructions for creating a service account user, even if that user's password is lost, you can't really do a huge amount with it. Right. Um, so while it takes a little bit longer, um, you reduce possible attack vectors. And so I think it's another example of our um, discovery. Yep. In fact, uh, there's a filter you mentioned earlier, you might want to not show the domain controllers and teleport. That's an example filter that you could apply to not do that. Yep. And so then we a have a little complicated uh, in terms of the, the syntax, but essentially each one of these filters forms a giant and condition. Um, so here we're saying the location is Oakland and then it's not a domain controller, which apparently 516 is the group ID that's always assigned to a domain controller. I would never have known that. Right. That's why it's uh, in the docs. AO exclude domain controllers. Well, so known as 516. Oh, and there's a handy LDAP filters for more information on the yep. syntax. Yep. And we will attempt to compile the filters you provide on startup. So if you give us a valid filter, you don't have to go through the, or an invalid filter, I should say. Um, there's not this giant trial and error loop where you don't know something's wrong until you try to connect to a desktop. You'll see on startup that the configuration's invalid and you need to fix your filter. Oh, that's a nice, nice addition. Um, yeah, so if you're looking at the configuration, recommend checking out our docs, uh, which is access, desktop access slash reference. Um, Hold on a second. I believe the sun has just come out, which is a rare thing because we've been raining all day. So I'm just going to close my window here. Oh, there we are. My camera will just adjust in a sec. All right, I'm back. 
Uh, all right, let's go on to number 35. Oh, do you have anything else to add for that RFD, Zach? Uh, nope, I think we can continue. Yeah. All right, number 35 is uh, Windows Difficult Authentication. And do you want to just give a quick overview of what uh, this RFD is about? Uh, yes. Yeah, so like I said, we didn't want to support username password authentication. Um, Teleport itself is a certificate authority. So we try to authenticate with certificates wherever we can. And the way you do that in Windows over RDP is with smart cards. So in a physical sense, you have a, a physical device, smart card reader that's plugged into the desktop. Um, and you insert your smart card and then there's an exchange of data uh, to the actual hardware device. Uh, Windows presents a challenge to the smart card. Um, smart card signs that challenge, sends it back. And ultimately when that whole exchange is done, like we trust that the user is allowed to connect and RDP allows the session or Windows allows the session to happen. Um, so when we want to extend that to an RDP connection, that's actually super interesting how it works is um, Windows desktop ship with a built-in driver that makes it look like there's a physical smart card reader connected to the machine. Um, but that driver is implemented by sending low-level hardware commands over the wire uh, from the client that you're connecting with to the remote desktop you're trying to access. Oh, and so the, the Windows itself, uh, at some level, doesn't even know the difference between a, a physical smart card was inserted or this is being emulated over the network. And for implementation, what that means for us is, uh, one, we had to make some updates to the Rust libraries to support the smart card emulation layer. Uh, but then we get to do all sorts of stuff. Um, like we have to provide metadata as to who's the vendor of this smart card, what features does it support, um, how does it kind of handshake with the, the hardware or the driver on the other end. Um, and when all that's done, uh, Windows just thinks that a trusted smart card was authenticated. And then that's kind of described in this uh, diagram here. Yep. Mostly the smart card info, this name would be sort of teleport virtual smart card slots is sort of predefined. Yep. Yeah. So when I said we had to add some support to the RDP library, that's that smart card virtual channel I was talking about there. Uh, so yeah, the RDP protocol uh, essentially allocates these things called virtual channels for different purposes. Um, they're kind of like separate streams of data um, so that all the data is not necessarily interleaved in separate uh, single purpose. Uh, so there's an entirely separate channel that you have to request when you make the connection and say, I want to allocate this channel for virtual smart card data to fly back and forth on the wire. Um, and kind of once that's done and you support all the right messages and protocols, um, this will work. So getting this to work was uh, a lot of great work by Andrew, who has since left us. But uh, it was one of those, you add support for one thing, and then the next error is like the smart card is saying it doesn't support this feature. And then you add that one in, and then eventually you have a smart card emulator that supports just enough um, to work. And so it's certainly not super fully featured as compared to a real physical smart card, but it does the job for us. Yeah. And um, is what does it mean by our low level hardware messages here? Right. So that's. Um, that's the equivalent of data that would actually be flowing between a physical smart card reader and a PC. So if you think like you're plugging in a smart card reader to a USB port um, and there's data exchange happening there and the system is asking for uh, data to be read or written, uh, we're doing the same thing just inside this uh, virtual channel for smart card data. And then here where we have server, is this teleport desktop service? in the, uh, this case? Uh, no, so this is actually inverted. Um, in this case, the server is the Windows desktop that you are connecting to um, because that's where the smart card service is running. Oh, okay. So, yeah, a little bit, a little bit confusing. And but... then the client is... Yes, teleport. Teleport. So teleport. Right. And, and so I think we can also just show this here because you see it for a second. 
it pops right. in connect a smart card i'm not doing the link and then it goes yep um so that that slight delay there where you saw the login screen is where that uh that virtual channel is being established and those low level hardware messages are being sent back and forth yeah um, and i think this is eventually like a new it, one right yep so it it auto logs you in as if like you just sat down and physically plugged in a smart card and it's like, Oh, now I have the information I need. I don't need to wait for you to enter credentials or username or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and I think this one has taken a while since this is a new, yep. And I'm popped in, which would be similar if I was to log in to any RDP, just because that machine hadn't been accessed, it has to set it up and configure it. Yep. And then the certificate that we present over the smart card interface that Teleport generates, uh, pretty similar to the certificates that Teleport has always generated. Uh, there's just kind of some additional requirements that Windows imposes on these certs. So we had to make some updates there. And um, we also issue these certs for, I think, only five minutes. So the idea is when you, every time you go to initiate a connection to a Windows desktop, Teleport's kind of giving you a one-time use certificate that's valid only for just enough time to connect and then invalid. So even if that were somehow intercepted uh, by the time anyone could use it, it's already invalidated. And then that's, is that sent during the initial RTP connection or the auth end challenge? Uh, it's kind of both. Okay. And then, so this um, certificate that's sent, this is just an active connection that I have. Can you just talk about yep. the connection options that you have now I'm connected? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. The I question. think, uh, you know, isn't it if I, if I become idle or if I, oh, log out, right. I know Teleport has certain session enforcement. Yep. Yeah. So Teleport has always had this idea of a client idle timeout uh, so that you can't just leave a session open, forget about it, walk away. And then somebody sits down at your workstation and kind of takes over. Um, so we just extended support for the same idle timeout. There's not an additional field or anything. Uh, your Windows desktop will automatically uh, respect that setting. And the way we detect idle activity here is we're actually looking for user input sent to the uh, RDP connection. So it has to be actual mouse movement or clipboard, keyboard presses, uh, scroll wheels, things like that. Uh, so even if Ben were to you know, stick a YouTube video on play on this remote desktop session. There is network data flying back and forth because that uh, desktop is being shared, but there's not really any client activity. And so Teleport would do the right thing and kick you off after that idle timeout's expired if you didn't move the mouse or anything like that. And does that just fit to Teleport standard default timeout? So if it has a you know, even if you have like a session duration of 24 hours or eight hours for like a work day, would it then terminate it after that period of time? Yeah, it's configurable. And I think it's also configurable by role as well. So different users can have different um, timeouts. So for somebody who maybe is using this to work for long periods of time during the day, you might grant them a little more leeway as to like a very sensitive system that you only need to connect to to check something out real quick and then you disconnect. Yeah. Cool. Uh, let's go back to flow. Um, did you do any research with Yubico's implementation? I know Andrew did a majority of this work, but I know they have something. Um, I haven't looked at it. They have some some helpful kind of information on smart card authentication with Windows, but uh, they're doing it in the physical sense with a hardware device as opposed to emulating it. Um, so I didn't have to look into that too much. Yeah. Um, and then I guess we have limitations, only logins into domain accounts, which is active, which is right. the active directory sort of limit for us. Yep. Um, and then this is probably the tweaks you talked about to make Correct. it specific. Right. Um, and then the UPN looks like an email address. Everything getting certificate, but it's not. Yeah, that's just the requirements for the certificates that we generate in order to connect, which are separate. Um, those are those five minute short lived uh, one time use connect to the Windows desktop certificates. So 
and then forwarding credentials was a nice to have. Um, uh, yeah, I think the idea here was if you did a nested RDP, so you use teleport to connect to one box and then connect it from that somewhere else, um, the smart card uh, commands would just continue to be forwarded uh, as many times as necessary. Uh, to be honest, I haven't tried it. Uh, it might work. <laughs> if it doesn't, it not. Uh, file an issue and <laughs> we'll take a look at it. Uh, I feel like we're going to have other issues before that, uh, just in terms of latency and things like that, that we still need to sort through. So, um, yeah. Do you want to yeah. talk about latency and some of the challenges? Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, as you kind of saw in the demo, it's, it's usable, um, uh, but we want to do better and we, we, we can, and we will do better. Uh, we just haven't put too much effort into it yet. Uh, our goal kind of was make it work and then try and make it faster. Um, so we're using like the RDP itself offers a lot of ways to basically reduce the amount of data that gets sent over the wire. And of course, the less data you send, the snappier the connection is going to seem. Um, so one option for us is to look into some of those extensions. Um, we're hesitant to do too much of that at this phase, because like I said, the more RDP functionality we lift into our protocol, the harder it may be to adopt other protocols. Um, so we, in addition to that, we also want to just do your standard profiling, look at how much data we're sending, look at where the time is being spent and kind of optimize from there. Um, we haven't started that. So, uh, like most things, there's hopefully some low hanging fruit that we can get quick. And then we kind of make a judgment call from there, uh, what our next step should be. Um, but the goal is that the performance here is as good as any remote desktop client. It'll never be quite the same as sitting in front of a physical desktop, but we want to close that gap to the extent that we can. Yeah, I know I downloaded pinball. It's a fun initial exercise and it was playable, but a bit laggy. Yeah. Uh, but I think the majority, you know, if you want to go web surfing, um, oh, which you can't on domain controllers, which is very wise, especially in Explorer, or at least you can turn it, turn off browsing. Um, it's still relatively snappy. On... I'm just going to hit my light, Ben. I oh, I the opposite it. problem as you is the sun is going down. Um. And then for, I think another interesting challenge of, you know, data on the wire is our session recordings, which probably now is a good time to talk about it. And so yeah, for sure. in our audit log, we have for SSH sessions, we provide this sort of output and we do this for keep cuddle execs. And this isn't, it's almost like a DVR, which just kind of seems a bit dated to say that nowadays. <laughs> it's probably like Twitch for your terminal. But it has the benefit of you can also pause it and um, you can copy and paste information from here and rewind. And this is something, functionality that we'll have for Teleport desktop access. Can you talk about some of those sort of challenges? Um, yeah, sure. So um, the first that I, I talked about earlier is there's just a lot more data with uh, a graphical session like this as to oppose to a uh, textual SSH session. Uh, so number one is just making sure that as we capture this data, we're not degrading the actual performance of the RDP session. Um, in terms of the recording, we have a kind of beta version of that internally, just getting ready. And uh, what we're doing to start is just capturing these TDP messages uh, as we send them to the browser. Nice thing about that is we're capturing at the layer that's not specific to Windows. So if in the future we add uh, different types of remote desktops that you can connect to, the session recording will just work. There's nothing Windows specific about it. Um, in terms of what's actually happening is uh, the majority of the messages that are being sent up to the browser are little PNGs, just tiny little images that are associated with one part of the screen and the browser gets it and it figures out which part of the screen that is and it draws that image there and just does that very fast to give the impression of you're uh, in front of a desktop. In this case, this be sort of like, do we sort of draw them as 
is it one large PNG or is it like individual sort of like no, it's, it's many small PNGs. I think there's 64 by 64 pixel uh, okay. tiles. Um, so sometimes if you are on a maybe a not so snappy connection, um, you can actually kind of see the effect of it drawing kind of top to bottom as those tiles fill in. Um, but yeah, the, the idea is ultimately if we can save those and then we also capture the time at which we captured them relative to the next one. We can then just play them back to the browser and essentially use the same exact browser code that we use in a live session to play the session back. The only difference is during playback, we don't need to capture user input or clicks or things like that because there's no desktop on the other end to send those back to. Yeah. Now this works great for being able to view uh, the session in the teleport web UI. Um, but you're kind of limited. Uh, suppose there was an incident or you did some troubleshooting the other day and you need to, you know, create an archive of, of what happened and you want to save that. Um, outside of having a live teleport cluster to be able to play back that session in, you don't really have a great way to watch it. Um, so ultimately, the idea is to have the kind of the stream of PNG images in the background uh, as our like first step for recording so that you you capture those as they're sent. Uh, but then maybe like in the background, we convert those to a more standard video format like MP4 or something where you have a full, uh, you know, playback video playback functionality. adjust the playback speed and seek to a particular spot like a DVR maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and uh and worked how that way large so has the initial recordings been uh so we don't have a really good answer for that because it's it's hard to quantify right um your screen right now is not sending any data to the browser because nothing's changing so we'd love to be able to say it's this many megabytes per minute of session but that's simply not the case um, because the, the amount of data we have to capture is totally dependent on the amount of activity that you have running. So, so one of the things you might like do... a YouTube video, it would exactly. be the same amount of videos. Yep. So, so we feel like we could get a worse case by just playing a video and capturing that session because it's always changing. And that would maybe give us an upper limit to the size of the data. Um, but we expect it's going to be pretty heavy. Um, PNGs are already... Uh, not super tiny format. Uh, we will compress it both over the wire and store store it on disk. But um, yeah, there'll be significantly more space required to store these as opposed to SSH recordings, which are quite small in comparison. Yeah. Um, and then I think other audit log activity, we have the session started event. Oh, it looks like Sasha just to- Sasha, what are you session. doing? Who knows? He's trying to break our demo. He's trying to break the demo on one of the nodes, a plugin node. But yeah, we will audit session start and stop events. Uh, if a session is terminated due to that client idle timeout, you would see an audit log there. Um, we haven't yet added support for um, clipboard or file transfers to and from the remote desktop. But those two things will also generate audit events. So you'll be able to see that, hey, uh, this user copied this file um, to the desktop or took this file off the desktop, uh, as well as uh, just clipboard actions. And then this will also be everything that you can change with the RBAC. So for certain machines, Correct. you can't download it or exfiltrate different information. Right. Yeah, and so for the um, SSH recording, we've kind of always just had a cluster-wide configuration setting. Do you want to record these sessions or not? Um, because we expect desktop session recordings to be quite a bit larger, uh, that'll be based on a role basis. So um, if you have a role that you use for non-sensitive environments that you don't uh, have quite high audit requirements and you don't really care who does what there, maybe you turn that off and save yourself some space and you only enable recording for access to the more sensitive or regulated environments. Yeah. And then for people who are using different storage backends, which we have a variety of options, and you can send 
the session recordings to S3, will there be a possible component in which people have to run, you know, some video processing to a sort of a background job, or would that be all within Teleport? Um, we support all those external backends today, or when we get this next feature out, I shouldn't say today because the work I have on my workstation is not available publicly yet. Um, so those will work uh, as far as video processing tools. We haven't really decided yet. Um, the number one goal right now is just to get a uh, functioning recording and playback feature out. Um, teleport users know and love that feature and we want to be available for desktops as well. Um, and then whether or not course. we support a like proper video format in the future uh, remains to be determined. I think in one of the RFDs you had up, we talked about running uh, FFmpeg in the browser as a way to encode um, encode yourself a video of the recorded session, and then oh, it's so like offloading to the and, client, basically. Right? Um, I don't expect that to perform very well uh, in the browser. Uh, another alternative we're looking at is today we have a TSH play functionality to play a recorded SSH session. And so there may be some incantation of that that you could run that basically converts a session uh, of a desktop recording uh, into a video file that it downloads locally. Um, or maybe we just in the background are periodically converting our recordings into videos. And once we have the video, then we can discard that giant stream of PNGs. Yeah, um, but sort of to be decided, which is kind of like right. a good time. It's almost like an RFD discussion of an RFD that's not started yet. Yep. Um, and then talking of that, I know we're almost up to an hour, but let's get on to number 37, um, which is the protocol. Um, all right, do you want to give an overview of the specifics of the protocol, which I think we've probably covered a lot already. Um, yeah, we talked a bit about this. The idea here is this is the protocol that surfaced to the browser. So this is what the browser is going to interpret uh, via WebSocket connection and ultimately draw on the screen using the HTML5 Canvas API. Um, these are simple binary messages. We wanted them to not require any uh, fancy dependencies or libraries to parse. Just wanted it to be um, easy to do in the uh, low code way. Um, so they're small, they're simple. Um, and that's kind of the way we like it. Uh, most of what you'll see here, like I said, the majority of the messages actually flowing is that PNG frame. Uh, but some of the other types of things we have going on is uh, for connection establishment, you need to know the size of the user screen. And then also if they resize their browser, we want to tell the remote desktop that the screen size has changed. We don't actually do that yet, which is why you're gonna see uh, the screen get distorted a little bit there. Oh, okay. Right, so we send that once when we establish the connection and then we don't send it again. Yeah, it's not um, space here. Yet, uh, we will. That'll be another one that we actually have to capture when we're recording session traffic as well, because as we're playing it back, if the screen size changed, we also want to change it in the playback. And then we have the frame. Um... Right, so the frame is always a one-way message is coming from teleport being sent to the browser. Uh, mouse move and mouse button are kind of the other directions So the browser is listening for native OS uh, events and then sending those back down to the desktop. Which the right click, everything else. Yeah, in fact, fun fact here, when you're doing that, the, the cursor that you see in that window is your Mac cursor. Um, the PNGs that the remote desktop are sending back to you don't contain a little arrow drawn on them. So the desktop is actually disabled drawing of the arrow. And oh. I didn't realize this until we actually had some session recording working. And then you realize things are just happening on the screen and I don't see the mouse. Um, fortunately, because we're capturing the traffic and we know which messages are related to the mouse moving or being pressed, we have the coordinates and we can then draw that on the canvas ourselves. So we'll be able to do things like either 
uh, we could actually draw the cursor or what we might do is just highlight uh, mouse clicks with maybe like a little pulsing animation or something to show that like a, a click was performed here. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I'm sure there's some security issue on which mouse movement can indicate a message or something that yeah. <laughs> can't be recorded. I'm sure someone will request it. Um, and then I guess we have keyboard input. Um, yeah, a lot of interesting stuff there to handle uh, different key combinations on different platforms and browsers. Uh, like we've learned that uh, the Mac RDP client, for example, will sometimes automatically translate uh, the command key to a control key when it sends messages over the wire. So that if you, for example, press command C to copy, well, by default, Windows would interpret that as Windows key C, which is not a copy uh, shortcut. Uh -huh. um, we're not doing anything like that. So we've started to notice like there's some discrepancies between RDP clients that are a little bit smarter and what we're doing. Um, but yeah, a lot of work here just to figure out uh, what the various uh, key combinations look like in different browsers and what we need to translate them to to get them down to the desktop. Yeah, one interesting thing I did earlier because I was locked out because I had to had a short window for my passwords and I had to reset it. Mm -hmm. And the RDP client that I was using on my Mac told me that I had to control alt delete mm -hmm. to, which gives you an option to change your password. For some reason that didn't work, I actually used my domain controller to reset my password. But actually it's an interesting thing. I don't want him to control alt delete. I think nothing works. Oh. Uh... Something yeah, happened. so it's it's interesting. The the clients are pretty smart. And at first, I thought they were just always remapping uh, command to control, but they're not. They're doing it under certain circumstances only, which is pretty clever. Yeah, I guess I have an option to open a new desktop window, which is something new. Oh, there we are. So in my case, my backspace and delete. I had to press my delete on my smaller keyboard, just not my backspace. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, I guess this is an interesting edge case. I accidentally locked it. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Always finding an edge case. Not to start a new session, I guess. Yeah. I should see if we could recreate that. Um, Oh, I know why. Probably no valid certificates were found for this smart card is I've locked it out and the smart card's only for five oh, minutes. Yeah, that actually makes sense. So it kind of makes sense, kind of shows you if you lock it. I The only way to get back into this was to go into to teleport. Restart and the session. Yeah. Restart the session. But I guess yeah, you don't have to control over these messages. Um, and then clipboard, something new that you're working on. Um, anything kind of interesting there? I know clipboards can be kind of funky bits of instruments. Uh, we've only briefly looked into this. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of prior art in this area for us to learn from. Um, I think it ultimately just comes down to what the browser will allow us to capture. Um, from my, my brief research, it looks like we might have to do some interesting workarounds and there might be some limitations just to the browser is just one application and it can't see all system level events. So um that's what we're going to be looking at there um copying from the windows desktop and then pasting on uh your client machine should be pretty easy uh, as the other direction we're a little worried about but uh like i said uh problem's been solved before just requires some research and we'll be looking into that when we finish session recording yeah probably as we said earlier probably differs per browser for chrome or yep Mozilla, uh, whichever one. Nice thing here is we reuse the same message. Uh, so it's just a clipboard data message and it may be a copy, it may be a paste, just depending on did the browser send it down or did teleport send it up? Yeah. Uh, and then we have scroll, which is also supported. Um, yeah, but I think that covers the protocol. Another kind of... Other question I'd have, why did we use PNG frames? 
Uh, so that's actually like the, the most basic level of RDP. That's what RDP sends. Um, so this is an area where we're trying not to be too like RDP, but um, we are in this case. Uh, there are different enhancements to RDP to change that format or change how those PNGs are constructed. We aren't trying to enable any of that right now. So as part of the connection and negotiation that we established with the desktop, Teleport kind of says like, we're not a very smart RDP client. Like you have to kind of revert to like the most version basic one behavior. Version right? one. Yeah. Oh, good to know. So it's sort of an RDP built-in option. Um, okay. Do you have anything else for the huge collection of RDP um, RFDs that we've gone through or Windows Desktop Access? I don't think so. Uh, I think we covered the features pretty well. Uh, a roadmap, obviously session recording is top of mind right now. Now we're going to move to uh, clipboard and file transfers, which is a commonly requested thing. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I know here we have our documentation. So this is more up to date for our RBAC and CLI. Um, it's not much to add here. And like I said, we have great getting started guide, which might have this other video which you can use. And I found this troubleshooting. These are common things that you might find during setup. Um, that can be a little confusing. The, I think all of our team have stumbled upon while setting this up. Yeah, I think that's the that's the. Uh, if you were to ask me, like, what's the thing about desktop access that maybe you lose sleep about? Uh, it would just be the the configuration and the setup and the troubleshooting. Um, so we're going to look to make that better as well. I think a lot of it is just. Uh, our relative inexperience with Windows uh, as compared to Linux and um, configuring Active Directory and getting everything set up appropriately. But um, we hope to make it easier and to automate more and more of it as we go. Uh, so, well, I hope that the getting started guides are helpful right now. I also hope to make them smaller and easier as time goes on. So your feedback there is appreciated. Yeah, and I think the best way to either get in touch with us is create an issue or we have our community Slack here, yep. both on GitHub or our forum, which is another good place, um, which is a GitHub discussion board. But yeah, I think similar to Slack, we're also looking for people who are new and looking to try to think and work with us to sort of get the rough edges um, for Teleport desktop access. Cool. Well, Zach, thank you for your time today. This was super informative. I've learned a thing or two along with my journey on te getting Teleport desktop access set up. Do you have any last closing thoughts or questions? Uh, no thoughts or questions. Thanks for the time. Appreciate it. And, All right. Uh, thanks, Zach. Catch you next time. All right. Yep. Thanks for watching. See ya.